This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you for coming here to hear about the vegetable germplasm conservation and research at the Plant Genetic Resources in Geneva, New York. I'm the vegetable curator for the Plant Genetic Resources Unit at the USDA ARS. The USDA is the uh, ARS National Plant Germplasm System, includes uh, germplasm repositories across the country, uh, all the way th Pullman to Miami and Geneva to Riverside, and also we have at Hilo in Hawaii. These include the regional plant introduction stations, various clonal repositories and crop specific uh, uh, collections, and also some uh, genetic stock collections. The National Plant Germplasm System is a national or network of people and organizations conserving plant genetic diversity. It includes both federal, state, and private organizations. The coordination is by the USDA ARS. While most of the funding is federal funding, there is also funding from state and private organizations. For example, the project at Geneva has funding from Cornell through the Northeast Nine project. And I also have different uh, companies, seed companies I work with like Noonams out in Oregon who help with uh, regenerations of onions. The major objectives of the National Plant Germplasm System which is the same for all the different plant introduction stations, colonial repositories, et cetera, is to acquire germplasm, to preserve the genetic diversity that we have, to document and catalog this, both passport and characterization and evaluation data, to evaluate this germplasm, and most importantly, distribute the germplasm. The germplasm collections are not museum collections, but they're living collections which are used. We have two uh, sites that are national in scope. The National Genetic Resources Laboratory operates the Genetic Resources Information Network. This has all the data available from collection, environmental data, where material was collected, Past, uh, characterization and evaluation data, and this is available anywhere in the world through the internet. We are releasing shortly, beginning October 1st, a new version of this uh, database, which is easier for users to access, where they can actually download large quantities of data through Excel sheets. The other major activity of this uh, laboratory is the plant exchange office. They make all the, uh, handle all the issues for germplasm exchange internationally, both germplasm coming in the U.S. and germplasm leaving the U.S. They also arrange for collection missions because now with the national rights for germplasm has come up in the Convention on Biological Diversity, there's many issues of getting permissions and handling benefit sharing for germplasm. The other activity of the National Genetic Resources Laboratory is also very important, is the crop germplasm committees. These are groups of users and other researchers who meet with the curators of various crops to set issues, for example, what should be characterized what should be uh, brought into the collection and deal with issues such as duplicates in developing vulnerability statements. We also have the National Seed Storage Laboratory in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's a part of a larger National Center for Genetic Resources Preservation. But they maintain base collections of all the germplasm across the country 
in Fort Collins at minus 20 uh, as far as seed. They also do research on new techniques for preserving germplasm, especially with the clonal repositories. Right now, the major clonal collection that's preserved is the apple collection. They're trying with using dormant buds and liquid nitrogen vapor. They're trying to develop techniques for other uh, clonal crops uh, that would be as successful as this technique is with apple. And they also maintain voucher samples such as the PVP samples and also some black box collections where we're just maintaining them as black boxes with no access. About the Plant Genetic Resources Unit, the National uh, Research and Marketing Act of 1946 authorized four regional plant introduction stations. Geneva is one of these. The others are at Pullman, Washington, Ames, Iowa, and Griffin, Georgia. In July 1948, the Northeast Regional Project, NE9, was started. This was developed into the North, Northeastern Regional Plant Introduction Station. Also in 1984, the Apple Repository was established as a part of the PGRU. It had been established several years earlier by Cornell University and was transferred to the Plant Genetic Resources Unit as a federal collection. And this, the two of them were merged in 1988 to form the Plant Genetic Resources Unit. So in 19, and since 1984, we've uh, added uh, Coates, uh, Hardy grapes, and tart cherries to the clonal repository. Our objectives are to conserve and regenerate plant genetic resources accessions in the gene bank and in the field as far as the clonal repositories to ensure its long-term availability for research and crop improvement. We are working to strategically expand the genetic diversity in the collection, but also to expand the information, both passport and characterization data that we have for these collections. We're working to both genetic, do genotypic and phenotypic characterization and evaluation of this germplasm to increase the utilization efficiency. Um, we've started recently both vegetable and fruit germplasm working on quality, nutritional traits and uh, traits that ha have a health benefiting effects. But our major, as with the whole ger uh, germplasm system, major objective is to distribute this germplasm both nationally and internationally. This shows the vegetable genetic resources conserved at Geneva, New York. She can, we have a total of about 12,580. Half of this collection is tomato. We have both cultivated and wild. The 6,600 includes about 600 accessions of wild tomato. Our other major collections are coal crops, or things such as cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, etc., and onion. But we do have large collections of squash and radish, and smaller collections of tomatillo or husk tomato, celery, etc. Uh, most of, uh, a large part of the tomato collection is backed up. Overall, 71% of our germplasm is backed up. And this is, like I mentioned before, at Fort Collins, Colorado. Our vegetable collections are basically seed propagated collections. Most of our crops, except tomato, are cross pollinated, many are biannual, and again, except for tomato, what we actually use to produce seed is not the product. So it's unlike other crops like agronomic crops, we have the problem that it's not the product that's used for the seed production. Our germplasm ac acquisition is from germplasm collection missions, but more and more recently has been from other germplasm collections. 
and from breeding programs, both public and private. But our acquisition is more targeted now. Specific regions for specific crops or specific traits or certain types of collection. Like we have a, uh, intergression populations for tomato that we acquired from uh, Israel that are available. And our collections are, our germplasm acquisition is user directed. Again, one of the major ways we do this is through those crop germplasm committees. They meet an average of every year to year and a half at various other meetings. We'll have this meeting. Also, we look at the pattern of seed requests. We see what kinds of crops are being requested, but what type of traits are being requested. Uh, uh, and this is what we're using to uh, direct our acquisition efforts. Just wanted to show, here is the US. And this is uh, origins for various vegetable crops. You can see that this shows the importance of the germplasm collections that we do have in the US. <clears throat> and one thing you need to point out, especially in this area and some of these areas, uh, it's very difficult to obtain access even to collect germplasm are to get germplasm back to the U.S. from other germplasm collections. It's very difficult to access this germplasm now with the Convention on Biological Diversity. So this stresses the importance of what we have and maintaining it. This, we did have a collection since I've been here in Mexico. You can see some of the genetic diversity here with tomatoes, tomatillo, and some beans. Our collection, this is a cultivated crop. I had previously been involved in about 35 collections uh, when I worked at ICARTA, uh, working with food legumes. But the principle is the same. Oftentimes, you go with cultivated crops to the field as they're being harvested to collect, so you know where the region is. But sometimes, you go to local markets. Uh, which are higher probability that the crop that's being sold is from that region. So if you go to a local market in Mexico like Puebla, you're probably getting a uh, crop that was grown locally. But if you go to the Mexico City, if you go there to a market, that, that uh, crop could have come from anywhere in the country. Just an example here with tomato, how germplasm, the tomato originated in Brazil, I mean in the Andes area. It went to South America and in the 1500s to Europe. The original tomato germplasm in the US came from Europe, not from the center of origin or where the crop was domesticated. And then in 1930s, USDA collectors and then later CM Rick at the Tomato Genetic Resources Center brought a lot of wild species germplasm into the US and this has been integrated into the populations for various traits such as disease resistance uh, and other uh, pest resistance. Again, some of the geographic origins of brassica here are where you see the leafy, vest the leafy ones cabbage, down in Italy, broccoli and cauliflower, and some indications of early domestication in the Mediterranean region, eastern part of it. Here is an example of a very uh, uh, difficult to accomplish, but we've done it. Germplasm exchange with China recently. We received, actually just about one month ago, 84 accessions of uh, Chinese cabbage, radish, and buckwheat from China. This is our first official exchange since the early 1930s with China for germplasm. And this is a direct result. We had sent broccoli and cauliflower uh, to China in 2012. Uh, 
and they were very excited with it and they led to them inviting myself and the research leader Dr. Zong to visit them at their expense in September last year about this time of year we had many discussions there uh, with the head of germplasm exchange at the CAES uh, about bilateral uh, germplasm exchanges and we've also recently sent germplasm of radish in the tomato core collection to China and in about 10 days we expect to have the vegetable curator from the Institute of Vegetables and Flowers in Beijing visiting us in uh, Geneva, New York and they want to discuss further uh, bilateral exchanges of germplasm. The discussions are also going on for the fruit germplasm, but we've already brought in vegetable germplasm. This is myself and Dr. Zong. We are here with the head of testing, laboratory testing, uh, at the Chinese National Gene Bank in uh, Beijing. We also went to Hanshu this is the, they're growing out here as you can see. This is the broccoli and cauliflower we sent them. They were very anxious that we go down and visit that. And they're uh, asking us to come back in the spring of next year because they hope to have this in the breeding program full blown in their breeding program. Uh, it's about two or three hundred kilometers from the Hanshu in the same province. This is uh, close to uh, uh, Hong Kong. So we've collected, uh, we're increasing the exchange of germplasm. The lady here in the uh, red blouse, her name is Dr. Mia Tao. She's very instrumental in getting the germplasm that we did in the US. And we're working out protocols with her that once germplasm is brought into China once, that they're going to be maintaining it. And when I receive a request for the same accessions, I will transmit it to her. And then they will do, they won't have to go through quarantine. They'll just distribute it from the Chinese National Gene Bank. And uh, they were very uh, open to this type of distributions. And so uh, she said that if they get a request for what they've sent to me from the US, they will do the same. So we're hoping to expand this uh, germplasm exchange to other vegetables. One, several concerns we've had with our collections are GMOs. They're difficult to put in the collections because first of all, it's not one patent, there's a series of patents and it's very difficult and we don't wanna keep track of all the different patents and what's still in place. Because it only takes one patent to make it non-distributable. The other, even more important, is the concern about contamination of GMO and non-GMO accessions. To the point that we had an inspection in the Office of Inspector General, we had inspectors come to us several times and go through all our list of accessions and actually go through the gene bank itself looking to make sure that we didn't have GMOs. The other concern we have is problems with IPR issues because these affect what will go in the collections, the MTAs, and they may reduce uh, to less germplasm entering. IPR means what? Intellectual property rights. And I'll give you a small example of this. Darth, Dr. Martha Mutchler has double haploid onions. She was done with them. She really thought they should be available for other people to use. And we accepted to put them in the collections. But then uh, Cornell's uh, IPR office got involved. And we had a lot of negotiations. But the MTA they wanted was too much for us to be able to follow up. We don't have the resources to do that. And so I was told by the national leader, program leader that we could not accept this type of MTA. So the germplasm, uh, we have our finite resources and staff, so we cannot put it into something that we can't really freely distribute. And this is gonna happen more in the future. 
even though she really would like to see it distributed and be a part of the collection because of that MTA was not a type of MTA we could deal with. It's not going in. Again, these MTAs affect our uh, freedom of distribution. The Convention on Biological Diversity is affecting collection missions and getting permissions. The Plant Exchange Office I mentioned has a lot more work nowadays for germplasm collections. Uh, we're worried about uncontrolled, uncontrolled growth of the collections. Uh, we have a finite resource for storage, for regeneration, for characterization. We're trying to avoid uh, duplication, both regionally, locally, na internationally. But because of the problems, it's becoming more and more difficult to distribute germplasm internationally because of uh, intellect, uh, property rights. Also, be, uh, I didn't mention before, quarantine is becoming so restrictive in some countries that it makes sense to have duplication so that you don't have to go through this quarantine. Because they're in some countries like Australia, I worked with when I was at ICARTA. They gave me $120,000 a year to work with fava bean germplasm to screen it for disease resistance because it cost them about $800 in accession to bring it in. So it was cheaper to pay us to, to go through the whole collection and get the score so they only brought in what was needed. And they provided pathologists to help. So quarantine issues are becoming very important for germplasm distribution also. Our, our crops are stored in Geneva at minus 20. So we maintain our collection at minus 20, which helps a lot in maintaining the viability. It's also backed up at minus 20 in Fort Collins. Our crops, as I said before, are mostly uh, cross-pollinated and many are biannual, so we use cages and we have beehives for pollination. This shows here a cage. The cages we use, this is uh, in Brassica here. Beehives, we use the cages with rented, we just use rented hives because the economics worked out much better for us. We do do some hand pollination uh, when we have uh, squash with small numbers of plants, it's easy to do it with hand pollination. Just an example, this is some broccoli uh, and tomatoes from this year. This broccoli here actually is one that we're working with uh, Thomas Borkman. This is actually his, his uh, population he's working with with this uh, SCRI grant. Again, brassica, we, we plant cabbage about the beginning of August, then in November dig it up, store it, and then in early fall set it out for seed production. Again, with some of the vegetable uh, leafy type uh, uh, brassicas, we will have to actually take them to the greenhouse our uh, poly house after the uh, have been grown in the field because we can't store them over winter. Another issue, short day onions. Here's what short day onions look like grown versus long day onions in Geneva, New York. You can't get them to really bulb. And if you brought bulbs in here, they wouldn't flower because of the need for short days. So we have an agreement with New Mexico State University and provide them funds to assist us in uh, regeneration of the short days. The main concerns we are concerned with with regeneration is loss of genetic diversity and loss of genetic identity. We're also concerned about producing disease-free seed and also uh, our brassica and allium is one of the main reasons we went to minus 20 because their shelf life is much less than, say, squash or tomato. 
Our major, another major activity is characterization of germplasm. This field is in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. Well, we, we work with breeders a lot with collabor uh, in collaboration for uh, characterization. I've worked uh, many agreements with Philip Griffiths looking at radish, broccoli, and cauliflower, for example. Uh, we have a minimal descriptor list we use for these crops, highly heritable traits, and we're working to increase the uh, efficiency of utilization of the germplasm and increasing, we have an increasing importance of quality in the past five years. Again, CG, we have this minimal descriptors list have been developed on the advice of the CGCs we're working with. And we've implemented this as part of our characterization. And what are the thing as part of our regeneration? And also regularly now we take digital images that was a strong recommendation from all five CGCs I have. Uh, again, we do molecular and uh, quality evaluation. This is a type of uh, image that we take for onion bulbs. Uh, this is what was strongly requested by the Allium CGC. Again, a, t a different type of image done with tomato. This one just happens to be one of the stuffing tomatoes we have. Some of them look like a red pepper, bell pepper, when you see them in the field. And people are surprised when I cut them open that they see a uh, tomato. The quality characterization has become more and more important. Uh, we have already put quality as part of our uh, characterization within our regeneration process for tomato. I've, I'll show you later a uh, tomato core collection and we've worked on multi-year, multi-site evaluation of quality for the tomato core collection with a number of collaborators. And we hope we're starting now our next five-year project plan and we're hoping to expand this to crops such as onion, and squash. Just the nutritional characterization with a standard preparation of samples which are stored at minus 20 for later evaluation. For, we have an automatic titrator here for uh, 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 titratable acidity, colorimeter for the lycopene. We measure vitamin C with a kit. We also have worked with the uh, chemist at the ARS in Albany, uh, California. For his samples with secondary metabolites, instead of this, they're doing the prep of the sample on liquid in liquid nitrogen at a cryo station. Our core set, as I mentioned, I won't go over each one, but they're basically different land races, heirlooms, a group based on the geodiversity, fruit shape, and then we have 50, we call obsolete varieties. These are where we could, we tried to trace them down to the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and eight, uh, 80s, and 90s, where we had PVP certificates, our information, other information that they were released in these decades. Again, we, d we have something from Ohio State tomato analyzer to look at the uh, various morphological traits of tomato. Uh, it measures a number of traits. This is uh, with heirlooms, several quality traits. And we found two lines, Sponzilla, and this one is something called AVRD6, which stood out for an, uh, several of the traits compared to the other accessions. And the same, the, there were duplications, geodiversity, land race, heirloom. They don't add up to 184 because some are in several groups. And this AVRD6 was in another group with the geodiversity. You can see it, it's high for all three traits. 
And then again, that we found significant uh, genotype effects for um, uh, these quality traits. One thing that we did was look at the different decades, uh, accessions from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. We did find a fairly strong, with bricks, a trend of reduced bricks from the 50s through the 90s, uh, and some type of indication for vitamin C, very small indication with titratable acidity. So there has been a reduction for sure in bricks and vitamin C to some extent. We took the 10, we have more data for the 10 from the 1990s. And what we did was canonical discriminant analysis. And what we had here was two years that we grew them. So for the morphological traits, the, the 10 gave exactly, they were right on top of each other for the morphological traits. The morphological traits were very good at uh, distinguishing these varieties from each other. And the, while the quality, you can see, they're not right on top of each other, they were fairly repeatable as far as the quality traits for these 10 varieties. We also did a discriminant. And what we were looking at here was Bell's Gourmet and Red Bear stick out from the rest of them. And the reason they do this is for the morphological was size traits. They were very different between the Red Pear and the Bell's Gourmet. The Bell's Gourmet, you get fruit that are like three pounds. It's really huge. And the Red Pear is a very small tomato. Whereas here with Red pear and Bell's Gourmet looking with the quality traits, what we noticed the difference was the different acids. The red pear was double the acid content of the uh, Bell's Gourmet. We, we were just trying to see which traits, and that's what showed up here for the quality factor analysis. The uh, first factor was traits, the sugar. And the second factor was these acid traits, citric acid, malic acid, titratable acidity. Joanne Labate, the molecular biologist, looked at these 50 populations that we had uh, for um, 18 SNPs. And what she did was divide them up differently. She divided them up into private breeding company uh, varieties and public varieties developed by uh, universities. And basically, there wasn't much difference between the two populations. It was, there wasn't much difference whether it was public or private. They showed the same uh, values in the SNPs. Another uh, work that we're starting on a new project plan is the GIS, or Geographical Information System. And what we're looking at, we, there are a set of species, new species, the, the new uh, monograph on tomato. Uh, Solanum peruvianum has been divided into four species, including peruvianum, arcanum, cornello merlii, and huliacense. And we were trying to see the geographic distribution of these species, and also to see how it, could we distinguish these species with markers. And she used some uh, SNPs, some genotyping by sequencing. I had uh, 14,043 SNPs. And what she did was took the red boxes this is distance, geographical distance. And the vertical axis is genetic distance. And what she did was uh, intraspecific. So that would be like 
a solanum pruvianum and a solanum pruvianum accessions, two accessions of the same species, whereas the blue ones are two accessions of different species, like pruvianum and arcanum. So what you see here with the red ones, the further they are apart physically, there's not a relationship with the genetic distance. But you can see there is a relationship of genetic distance and geographic distance for the interspecific pairs. So this shows as the, the species get further apart, they're more distinct from each other. And uh, this is shown when you try to taxonomically key these out, which we took all 200 and did. We ran into problems, and I think you can see that if they're close to each other in geographic distance, they become more close in genetic distance, and it becomes more difficult. She looked at them in a, with a heat map. Basically, some species are easy to tell apart, Peruvianum and Arcanum. So here, the, this is the frequency of one species, Arcanum, and this is the frequency of the allele and a uh, uh, Peruvianum. So the darker this is, the number, the greater the number of alleles. So you can see a pattern like this. So it's, these two species are separate, are easily, easy, more easily separated, whereas Peruvianum and Cornell Murlii, which is what we saw in the field, is very difficult to tell them apart. You can see with the SNPs that there's n not this pattern which would distinguish them from each other as far as allele frequencies. And again, she used this, uh, the same data. Here's our canum, fairly easy to separate it from the rest. And then the rest of them are up here, except Huliacense. We had a number of these that we could tell right away but some that were more difficult, and that was these. So the species taxonomically that the taxonomists have made, you run into problems with certain ones, and it's probably because of gene flow between the species actually telling them apart. Again, with characterization, in evaluation, we're concerned about importance and heritability of our traits and reporting disease scores consistently. Replication, both in time and environment. Also, we have, like with tomato, we have multi-location, multi-year evaluations and comparisons. And again, as I mentioned, with all, not only at Geneva, but at other plant introduction stations and repositories, there's concern about quality, nutrition, and health benefit traits. Oops. To, uh, we work with outreach and training and germplasm conservation and regeneration with markers and seed production and seed storage for characterization and evaluation and we do have outreach efforts in seed production for organic production, both processing and actual control of pollinations. And we've worked with demonstrations and field days. We've had three projects, the Public Seed Initiative, which was IFAS funded, and the Organic Seed Partnership, and the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative, NOVIC, uh, those have been funded by the uh, OREI. The first two were with Dr. Molly John. The NOVIC, the last one, has been with Dr. Michael Mazurik as a collaborator. The NOVIC, again, is uh, Cornell is a part of that, Oregon State, was University of Wisconsin, Washington State. Also uh, an NGO, the Organic Seed Alliance and ourselves, uh, the USDA. This Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative is working, as you can see here, we're working with seed production, seed processing, 
Also, we're looking at testing of organic varieties on farmers' fields under organic conditions so that they can grow varieties which perform best under their conditions. And the breeding programs have been working on, uh, besides disease resistance, also extending uh, the season, like with sweet corn, make, uh, developing sweet corn, which is more cold tolerant at the seedling stage. Here's uh, at PGRU working with some uh, people with uh, training in seed cleaning. We've, this is a public seed initiative. We were at a, the organic field day here at Freeville. Uh, two weeks ago, my staff and I were at the organic field day again in Freeville. We also go regularly to the common fair ground, uh, ground fair showing different aspects of seed production and providing information for different uh, for producing seed not only processing but pollination control and so on uh, we'll be going there Thursday this week again here is a student who had recently graduated from RIT an adult student who had finished recently and had further training with us and uh, two weeks ago she was hired at a laboratory in Rochester. Finally, the distribution of the germplasm is worldwide both to the US and to the internationally. 35 to 40 percent of all the samples I distribute are out of the US. So we do a large amount of germplasm distribution outside the US. We try to do it for breeders, other researchers, where there's a valid use for the germplasm distribution. Uh, we distribute to nonprofit organizations, other institutes, and universities. Just the example, a large amount of our germplasm is tomato, as you can see here. But look at these totals. We start 2008. 3515 in their last year, 14,290. And with sequestration and not being able to fill positions, this has been very difficult dealing with these uh, distributions. Uh, and there's not just small distributions. There have been, uh, we've provided South Korea with whole collections of our germplasm, like the whole tomato, the whole onion collection. Larry, a question. Um, in, in the last four years, it has gone up by like fourfold. Yeah. So what, what was it like before 2008? Was, was there, I mean, what, what happened? It was around three to 4,000 every year before 2008. So why has it grown so much then in the last four years? Well, one thing was, and we cut it out, some of it was these uh, non-research requests. We were giving that to them and saying, we won't be able to give it to you again. But we've had a number, like Noonan Seed has asked for our whole onion collection and whole tomato collection. And I told them, why do you need it now? They said, we're worried about access in the future. I said, I just can't do it. You're and so they provided me they came themselves and helped take the seed under our supervision. So they came and actually did it. Uh, we've been repatriating germplasm to places like South Korea where they give a list of stuff they think originally came. Then they, uh, there have been companies doing large scale screenings like onion for Irish yellow spot virus resistance. So these have what have increased our distributions. Some of our problems is the, this germplasm is distributed freely, but there are increasing numbers of non-research requests. Does that mean farmers? We don't provide to farmers. What do you mean by non-research? Well, we get a lot of gardeners and private individuals saying they're gonna do research. And what we've done is basically uh, telling them where they can find seed that's more appropriate to them. We used to, a lot of the sites in the germplasm system used to say, okay, here's some of what you asked for, 
please don't ask in the future. These are where you can go. Now we've taken a very hard stand that if you're not, if, we, if I don't consider it a valid use, we send a rejection letter. Most people accept it. Uh, some complain. And then of those, probably one out of 10 who complain, I'll relook at it and give it to them. Other issues are our costs for shipping and phytosanitary certificates have really increased. And we've been requested to provide certification as GMO, genetically modified, as being free of that. Because of national policy, I cannot provide that. I cannot provide a letter that says that we certify as GMO free. I cannot provide a letter that says, to the best of my knowledge, there should be, it should be genetic GMO free. That's national policy. It's out of my hands. And then requirements of certification is disease and virus free. Because of the way we're multiplying stuff every year, we have 400 plots a year for seed. I can't do that. We don't have the resources for field inspections, roguing, and testing. It's just too much. We ask them to get a research exemption if they want that. And then again, our intellectual property rights is always an issue with distribution. So in summary, we conserve, regenerate, characterize, evaluate, and distribute germplasm of our fruit and vegetable crops. The deg degradation of environments where the centers of origin is making our collections more important. Also, the lack of access to these centers of origin and centers of diversity are making the collections more important now. This germplasm is needed to maintain and improve crop uh, res uh, tolerances and resistances. We keep getting more and more crops. We're asking for quality traits, not just tomato, but they've started asking for onions, for fructans, for example, quercetin. Uh, and we're using the GBS, the molecular biologist, and then GIS uh, to our characterization and evaluation. I'd just like to acknowledge the staff in the Plant Genetic Resources Unit Joanne Labate is the uh, molecular uh, biologist, geneticist. Uh, Bill Garman is our farm manager. Jonathan Spencer works with our bees in characterization. Paul Kisley with the greenhouse. Sherry Tennis handles all the uh, database work and uh, paperwork for seed orders. Nancy Consoli works with us recently. She takes care of all the seed orders and seed uh, packaging and so on. Suzanne Sheffer in the green uh, laboratory and now field characterization. Suzanne Zweiker is a, uh, was a trainee that worked a lot with the tomato characterization. I worked very much with Philip Griffiths uh, with different characterization projects. And with Michael Mazurik, not only with Nobit, but also with characterization, and previously with Molly John. Mark Farnham is the ARS Brassica breeder who has been involved in the characterization. Andrew Brexa worked with us with the um, uh, secondary metabolites characterization for tomato. Uh, Christopher Kramer is the onion breeder, short day breeder at New Mexico State, has helped out tremendously with short day onion regenerations. Jim Myers heads up the Novik project at Oregon State. Dillip Panthe has worked very much with us, along with Esther Vandernap, uh, in the tomato uh, core collection quality characterization. So um, thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.